So, I'm delighted to be here with Paul Blaney, whose book, Mr Spoonface, came out at the end of last year. Um, Paul, do you want to tell us a little bit about Mr Spoonface? Um, it was my first full-length novel. It took a long time to write. Um, it's the line I always come out with when people ask me what it's about. It's about fatherhood in the age of artificial reproduction. Um, so what it means to be a father in an era in an era of test tube babies and in vitro fertilization and all that good stuff, um, how that's changed the changed the landscape of fatherhood. Mm. And having, I mean, um, I've read the book and liked it very much. I've reviewed it on, uh, on my so. blog. Um, and I'm I'm wondering because I think when I read it, it felt like it wasn't just about the main character's desire to be a parent or um, or even to kind of grapple with the idea of being a father because he has issues with his own father. But it seemed to me it was also about this idea of just being creative, of trying to fill a kind of hole which he has in his life and perhaps a hole which other people feel they have in their lives too. How would you feel about that? Yeah, that makes sense to me. He's um, He seems to me he's like a lot of people I know, like myself to some extent, uh, who reach a certain age, I think Fred is 37 when the book starts, and he's got a reasonably successful career, he's financially secure, but there's something missing in his life. I think a lot of people that I have known have reached that stage in life where they don't know what's missing. And if you're a woman, then it's obviously, there's you've got your biological clock ticking and you're thinking, oh, maybe what I need to complete my life is a child. Um, or other people might change career or move to a different country or something like that. I wanted to look at the men's point of view because it's also possible for a man, I think, to think that there's something missing from my life. What can it be? Maybe I need to have children. Um, not, not that, not no biological clock involved, but I think I wanted, I think I, I've, I've read quite a number of works about women and biological clocks and that aspect of a woman's life and I wanted to look at it from a men, men's point of view. Uh, and Fred has just kind of gone away, well he's been away in Hong Kong for about six years isn't it? Something like that. Yeah. And, and he's come back mostly because of, of a feeling that his life doesn't really have any meaning. Um, but it's not the only book that you've written about Hong Kong. And you, you obviously, you you must have been there. I'm assuming yourself. And is there a? Do you think there are parts? Do you do you think some of your own life is coming out in some of these books? To some Hong extent? Kong was yeah. I lived in Hong Kong from about ninety four to nineteen ninety eight, um, and it was a very vivid time for me. I felt quite compelled to write about Hong Kong. It's a very strange, one could even say exotic sort of place. Um, there's a lot going on, a lot, there's, there's a lot, if you sit by the river or by the harbour in Hong Kong, there's a lot of things going on and, you know, puzzling things. You're wondering, what's that going? Where's that boat going? What's what's happening here? So, and a very vibrant city and, and very strange to me. Um, so that, that compelled me to write about it. Um, also, Mostly people I knew in Hong Kong were expatriates, so there was that whole element of what 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 was in Africa. It was called white mischief. There's a novel, white mischief, but it sort of also describes a whole genre of writing in which British people or Americans go to somewhere exotic and end up misbehaving in ways that they would never have done if they'd stayed at home. So that idea that We've, I wouldn't do this at home because my parents might find out but I've, 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 I'm over here and this is China or Africa mm. or whatever and different rules apply. Um, Hong Kong was an interest, yeah, I suppose I was in Hong Kong in my late 20s and early 30s. Um, and yeah, it, it did feel, it felt like a sort of crossroads in my life looking back, I think. I didn't, I didn't really... I get uh, probably the most money I've ever made in my life. I had a good career. I had a comfortable place to live. I had the material things, but I didn't really know. It wasn't fulfilling me after a while, spiritually, we could say. Um, 
So instead of going and going to London and having a baby, I moved to the west coast of America and did an, uh, went back into education, did an MFA in creative writing. Um, I guess you could say as a way of looking for more meaning in my life at that mm. stage. No, it's interesting because you're making me think of The Anchoress, and, um, which is another of your, your books, and I think one of my favourites, just because she, that this woman just hides herself in her flat and doesn't go out. In fact, she's, not, she's in two rooms, is the bathroom in there? Yeah, kind of her... L-shaped connecting bathroom and a walk-in closet. Yeah, and she just stays there, doesn't go to work, doesn't go out at all for months. And, and again, she's kind of trying to find a meaning in, in modern life, I think. It seems to me you're very interested in, in the world in which we live right now and how we're able to connect with it, because it can be quite a seemingly... I mean, you can do lots of things to feel like you're interacting with other people, but actually ultimately be lonely. Yeah, we have sort of maximal sort of connections we can be connected to each other all the time but the quality of those connections seems to have been um, reduced and I think that can leave people quite lonely I, I think in the anchors I was thinking about connections I was thinking about as writing as a quite I think of myself as quite a shy introverted person and this was quite an introverted character and it's a bit of a therapy novel in some ways I think as well really I think of her as trying to I think she says something in the book like She's trying to decide what sort of relationship, if any, she wants to have with the world. So that the fact of locking herself in her bathroom kind of gives her a mediated relationship. So that's, that, that space becomes a sort of experimental space where she can try out different forms of mediated connection with the world, talking to people through the door or under the door or through the wall. And then in the end, she does decide she wants to come out and be in the world. But um, she's undergone some changes in the me in the meantime. She, she was a person who was kind of not 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 content with her connection to the world. Um, probably a, probably an intimacy issue that I suppose that feeling like she's, which I think we get in modern life that we're connected and we're connecting to people all the time through all devices and in person, without really making deep intimate connections. It's, it, the the facility of all that connection can can make things quite superficial I think so she was looking for the possibility I think of, of, a, of a more genuine more satisfying more intimate connection mm. and do you think I mean which, I, a connection which which scared her at the same time yeah I mean I suppose that's the thing with a book isn't it it's actually in a way you make a very intimate connection with a stranger without actually having to be there it's, um, mm -hmm. You know, writer and reader don't meet, but they are, yeah. they are at the same time through the words. Yeah, but, safe intimacy. <laughs> um, and you're drawn to shorter things. Do you think, I mean, I know Mr. Spoofface is a novel, but The Anchoress is more like a novella, and a lot of your other works are, are short stories. And do you think there's something, is there something about intimacy in that kind of shift? It is a shorter piece, a more kind of, I don't know, a shorter burst of intimacy, or does it not work like that? I think my, my I was brought up, uh, well, I, was, I, I learned my craft, I think, writing short stories. Um, then there's the element of time, because I, I have a full-time job, so that doesn't really lend itself to the sort of continuous time you need to write longer work. And I get, I get more satisfaction in some ways out of short stories, and, po and poems in the same way. Because I can have an inspiration to to write something new. I can try it. It can be done in in a, an afternoon or a day or a week. And then I can revise it and it's done. Whereas yeah. the novel is more about the sort of slow plodding. Not that there's no inspiration involved, but it, it's a lot. To, it seems to me about getting from A to B at a rate of five hundred or a thousand words a day. Um, I don't like that setting myself. I'm not very good at continuity. Maybe I just have a short attention span. I love, and, and I get great pleasure artistically, I think, out of seeing how short I can make things go, almost like a, like a miniaturist painter, mm. like, and seeing how, how narrowly I can focus something and then how many words I can take out. That's my greatest pleasure as a writer, is to, to find a sentence or a paragraph or just a word that, that seems superfluous and take it out. 
So sort of that, yeah, minimalism, I suppose, is mm. what we're talking about. Yeah. And you're now, well, you've pretty much finished writing the draft of something else. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, my, I finally, it's always a little embarrassed because I, I was brought up Catholic and this seems incredibly Catholic. Um, it's really about, it's, it, well, the basic, it starts with a young man who works in a petrol station and he goes to clean the bathroom and discovers what appears to be and what he perceives to be a crown of thorns wedged behind the toilet. Somebody really thinks somebody's left it in there. He also then decides it was left there specifically for him and he sort of, um, he picks up the crown of thorns. He, uh, eventually he'll put it on but he kind of picks it up and runs with it and um, I don't I don't want to talk too much about where he goes with it but it, it's a sort of exploration of sacrifice and in, in a way and it, it took me a while to work this out as often with writing I didn't really know what what this book was about until I was about halfway through the first draft it, it's really about trying to understand the motivations or what sort of person will sacrifice their lives for a cause. So I'm, I'm really, in, in many ways, I'm thinking about ISIS. And in, mm. in, I didn't set out to do that. I think it would have felt quite cheap to me to set out to write a book like that. But I think it came to me incidentally like that. I mean, I, it, and, and the whole idea did come from, I was, I was in Lewis a couple of summers ago and I was in a cafe and I went into the bathroom and there was what appeared to be a crown of thorns wedged behind the toilet bowl. I didn't pick it up or <laughs> end up crucifying myself or anything, but but I, I, it did stick with me. I was like, it's one of those things like life being, life often being stranger than fiction. Because mm. who would have thought it? I mean, I, I, my only guess was that the, this was a sort of artsy cafe. Maybe they had, maybe it, was, it had been an artwork or it was left over for some theater production. Um, but yeah, so the, the character in the novel, um, He's slightly different um, from your ISIS suicide bomber who's going to blow himself up and kill a lot of people at the same time. He kind of gets it into his head that that his that he has a mission that he's been chosen that, that this wasn't random. His finding of the crown of thorns and that his his mission is to sacrifice himself for the as an example to the world, mm. um, which is a it's kind of a crazy idea. But I hope it comes across as plausible in the book. But I think, I think, yeah, I like the idea of, in a sense, that strange, out-of-place object. And I think, and in others of, in other stories that you've written, that you quite enjoy the possibility of, like, say, that story you wrote about, about um, people just floating off into the air. Um, strange happenings that aren't necessarily, or that, that have that feel, I suppose, magic, magically real yeah. rather than definitely real. Yeah, I like working that line between whether there's, there's some kind of peculiar things happening in the story um, and, there's, and they, could, they could, according to the reader's concept, they could be thought of as magical or supernatural or they could be not, but kind of working that line. And do you think that's an easier line to work in something shorter? Probably, yeah. Yeah, I'll, well, I'll have to think I, about I, that I, when I get back to The Crown of Thorns, to yeah, the last draft. Because, I mean, I'm lucky enough to have read some draft of, of The Crown of Thorns, and I think one of the things that I enjoyed when I was reading it was that that element was there, and I think that is an element that often is in your shorter fiction, and I think it was the first time I felt like I'd found it in something longer, and I enjoyed that. Mm. Um, I think there's elements of it in The Anchorist, but not so... Maybe not so overtly. Yeah. Yes. There's some uncanny things happening Definitely. in the express. Yeah. But there's not quite a there's not quite a, a crown of thorns, which could be the crown of thorns. But I suppose the moment that you fix and move in on one person's mind, then you're free to go along all avenues, aren't they? Aren't mm -hmm. you? Really? Yeah, the important thing in the crown of thorns is that it should seem to him, seem to him to be a destined for him that it's come into his possession not by chance, and B that that this is no ordinary kind of crown of thorns. This is this is a powerful 
magical object that who's uh, and potentially a force that can be used for great good in the world. Yeah, kind but of. But it's going to be crazy all at once. <laughs> but it's going to be painful. <laughs> there will be blood. Um. So, if someone was coming to your work for the first time, what would you say read first? Whatever you can get your hands on. Or... Mm. <laughs> I. I suppose I'd like I'd like people to look for short stories, really. Um, I'm, I feel like, so, to me, to me, my best and most interesting work has, has, has often been the short stories. Um, now they'd be harder to find, and they may be scattered across the internet. They can probably be found. Do you think this might be the time for a collection? I think it could be. Um, I've always, I, I, you know, I've, I've written. I. I, I I almost gave up on short stories in a sense through lack of an outlet for them, because um, I just felt I was just I would I would write and write and write short stories and occasionally I would send them out, but mostly I wouldn't even bother doing that mm. in the end because because um, I suppose I got used to you know I could get them published online or I could get them published maybe in an anthology or something and I'd done that and I thought I thought I, I suppose maybe that sounds a bit egotistical but I wanted more I, I did want a collection I think I think I've got. You know, I've probably got 80 or 100 short stories to choose from. And I think for, out of that, I could make a very strong and interesting and diverse collection. And that's kind of what I want to happen. Then you should do it. All right. You saw then it I here will. first. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you, Paul. I, unless there's thank anything you, that you feel you need to, you would like to say about writing. I mean, you, you've now got, now you're writing poetry, which you never did before. I've always done it a bit on the sly. On the sly. I wrote one the other morning uh, in somebody's guest book after I stayed on stayed the weekend in Dartmoor. I wrote a poem in their guest book. Um, I love writing poems. Poems is very interesting to me because I'm not a poet. Yeah. So very liberating. In the same way I might do a drawing or something. It doesn't have, it's not loaded in the same way that fiction writing is, you know, fiction writing I, I'm... I, I'm more likely sooner in the process to start asking myself, is this any good or is yeah. this complete rubbish? Poems, um, you know, because I don't think of myself as a poet, I, I, don't, I don't feel obliged to meet some standard. Mm. So I can, that, that's very freeing. Yeah, I think that's the reason I don't write poetry, because I'm fully aware that I don't, and would never meet any standards, so I just don't do it. It's like the guy, I mean, I've always thought about this, that guy we used to know, Tadeusz. Yes. Derigowski. Yeah. I don't know what happened to him. Um, last seen with an air stewardess, I think. Um, I think he lives in Europe now. Nice. Um, but the, I always thought he was a very interesting example because he, he thought of himself as a painter and he did those sort of Matisse type paintings, which I yeah. thought, thought were very good. But that was what that was the, the, the style of art in which he took himself seriously. And then he wrote short stories on the side, but he didn't take them too seriously. And he wrote them from the point of view of, of I, I, I'm going to write the short story and then I'll read it aloud and it'll be amusing to my friends. So he didn't have any hang-ups about it. And I mm. thought the short stories were, were wonderful. Yeah, they were. Yeah, you know, and like anything really that I've ever read. Um, you know, I still read them to my classes on occasion. So there. <laughs> um, okay <laughs> thank you Paul um, and I hope to be back with another interview sometime in the next few months Hurrah. thank you thank you